Good morning and welcome to this morning's School of Law and Justice Research Seminar in which Dr Jeremy Patrick and Dr Vito Breeder will argue a series of three debates on faith and democracy. There's three debates, each with a different topic, and so I'll introduce each debate separately before we commence, and then there'll be an opportunity to ask some questions at the end of each debate as well as at the end of the seminar. So Dr Patrick and Dr Breda are both lecturers in law here at the School of Law and Justice at the University of Southern Queensland. Dr Patrick's work focuses on law and religion and he's published several articles on topics such as blasphemy, school chaplaincy and state neutrality. He's also in the process of finalising a book titled Freedom of Religion at the Margins, which will be published by the University of British Columbia Press in 2017. Dr Breeder's research focuses on jurisprudence and public law and he holds a visiting professorship in comparative thought at Bilbao. Dr Breeder was McCormick Fellow at the Law School of the University of Edinburgh in 2014 to 2015 and he has previously held positions at, as a visiting fellow at the Centre for European Studies at the Australian National University and as a lecturer at the Cardiff Law School. So we look forward to hearing their debate about the intersection of faith and democracy today. The first debate addresses the topic, should women be allowed to wear the burqa in public? Dr Breeder will take the negative position, arguing that women should not be allowed to wear the burqa, and Dr Patrick will argue for the affirmative. So at the time of recording, the countries that have a current national ban include Belgium, France, Chad and a partial ban in the Netherlands. French law bans the concealment of the face in public and imposes a $205 fine and a class on French values. Belgium imposes a $197 fine or up to seven days in jail and the Netherlands bans the wearing of the burqa in government buildings on public transport and in educational facilities and healthcare institutions. And in other countries there may be local restrictions in certain cities or regions and those in, in countries such as Italy, Spain, Switzerland, Russia and China. In Canada, the federal government has indicated that it plans to introduce a bill to ban the, the wearing of the niqab at citizenship ceremonies and Quebec plans to legislate against the wearing of the niqab by public servants and both proposals may face constitutional challenge. In Australia, there was a proposed interim ban on women wearing the burqa in Parliament House in October 2014 over a fear of protest by visitors work wearing the burqa, but this faced controversy and was discontinued. In February 2015, New South Wales announced new rules that require anyone who asks a justice of the peace or lawyer to witness a statutory declaration to remove all head coverings and Senator Jackie Lambie drafted a bill in October 2014 that would impose a $3,400 fine for anyone wearing the burqa in public. So we'll shortly commence the debate. I should indicate a disclaimer that the views expressed here are for the purpose of debate and discussion only and they don't necessarily represent the personal views of the presenters or of the University of Southern Queensland. So I won't ask people to indicate whether they're for or against the position of the debate at the moment, but at the end of the debate, there'll perhaps be an opportunity for you to indicate if your views have been changed as a result of the arguments presented um, this morning. So thank you. I'll now hand over to Vito and Jeremy. Okay, well, I'll get started. So I'm taking the um, position that women should be allowed to wear the burqa in public. And I think as a, a preliminary part of this debate, there's a lot of uh, rhetoric and there's been a lot of exaggerations and, and mistruths in, in the debate over um, burqa bans in Australia and in other countries. And one of the key points I think is important to make is many people believe that Muslim women are being forced or coerced by their husbands or by their imams, religious leaders, or by their religious religions themselves to wear the burqa. Um, however, research has shown that in Western countries, women who choose to wear the burqa 
are choosing it. They're not being, for the most part, coerced by their husbands or by their brothers or by someone else. So the percentage of women who are forced to the burqa is very small in Western countries. The second uh, main point I'd like to make is that many of the fears of um, public security being threatened uh, by people wearing the burqa in public are, are overblown. There might be an argument that in certain high security areas, airports or banks or something like that, a ban on covering the face, that maybe could be justified. But a ban um, like is currently in France, like would be under Senator uh, Jackie Lambert's uh, proposed bill go much further than that, and they ban wearing the burqa in any public place, public transport, the sidewalk, um, a shopping mall, anywhere. And there simply is no security justification for a ban that goes that far. There are many instances where people in public cover their faces, whether it's a motorcycle helmet or a ski mask or Halloween is coming up. So in the U.S. and uh, England, millions of people will be covering their faces. And uh, this sort of burqa ban is not justified by either of these rationales uh, that I've mentioned. Okay. Thank you very much, Jeremy. Thank you very much, Katie. And uh, my argument here is that in certain uh, circumstances, uh, uh, women should not be allowed to wear the burqa. And we already deal with some of the aspect about public security, that aspect obviously conceive. Um, there are other areas, or in the airport, it's in an area in which women are being asked uh, to identify themselves. All these things have to be done with the respect of a religious belief, so it has to be done in a, in a situation in which the women do not feel humiliated by that. And most of part of Middle East countries provide passport control for women wearing a burqa in which the women reveal themselves just to another woman in a private area. What we are dealing here is something which is much more smaller than uh, uh, widespread ban is uh, is the ban on uh, a burqa when that burqa prevent a political engagement, an active political engagement of that individual with the community around that. So uh, we know and we and we expect that our representatives, so those who are, who are elected by us, that they are responsible, they are accountable for what they are saying or what they do. In that situation, uh, it would be unacceptable in most Western society to have our political representatives to act in a way that abscond their activities. So they have to be responsible for what they do. The same level of accountability should be expected by women or every individual who engage in the public sphere. So we are dealing with a particular ban or a particular ban of wearing a burqa in a public engagement, which has political connotations. Okay. So the example of banning people who are individuals, women wearing the burqa in the parliament house, didn't make much sense because their role inside the parliament was passive. They were not making claims. They were not making political claims for which we expect the modern liberal society people be accountable for. They were just there to attend. But in a situation in which they engage the public sphere, they engage in which they're making political claims, in that situation, now it is expected that their identity will be revealed. Now, there are different ways, pragmatic ways when these things can be done, but the key issue there is not so much wearing the burqa, but make sure that the political claims are claims uh, which engage one individual with the rest of the community can be accounted and that level of accountability require uh, uh, the possibility to be identified and wearing the mask prevent that. Well, I, th I think I have, I have two responses there. One, I would, I would challenge th the threshold position that, that you're claiming that uh, liberal democratic societies have an expectation that people who participate in debate um, reveal who they are. There is a, a long tradition of um, anonymous pamphleteers. Uh, we have secret ballots when it comes to voting. Mm. There are a lot of places where people, their positions do not have to be linked to their identity. Um, and then the, the second aspect I think is, is problematic with what you're saying is that you're forcing Muslim women who do believe that wearing the burqa is a religious principle to choose between either violating their religious beliefs 
or participating in democracy. And that's a choice that no one should be put to. We should be able to accommodate both of these desires so that they can both satisfy their religious beliefs that modesty or, or other principles require them to conceal their faces, but also uh, in a way that allows them to express their views on political issues. Um. Again, the argument here has to be qualified a bit. Uh, the first, and I think is the, the most important point, is about uh, a woman which is being prevented to engage the political debate because uh, she believes that uh, wearing, a burka, wearing a burka is an essential element of her political engagement. Uh, the bit about uh, being, her being forced to do so as being already engaged. So she, she had to make the decision. She cannot be forced to, uh, to use the burqa, and that is, is just a, a, a strategy by proxy to prevent her to engage the political arena. So she decided to wear a burqa, and she engaged in a political debate or a debate like this one. Uh, now, my, we are dealing with the pragmatic issues. Is either uh, um, we allow uh, a system to identify her, and so she can present, she can engage in the political arena with the burqa. Okay, we know exactly who this person is. Okay, and so that the ban would not apply. Or in a situation, or there is the other situation, the ones I talking about, in which uh, someone intervenes in the public arena, and she, and uh, she claims I wear the burqa, and and I don't, I refuse to be recognized by it. Okay, that is just the limited uh, situation which will engage the burqa. Uh, a ban. So, no, if you want to engage in impromptu in a political debate, now you have to show who you are. Uh, the second bit is about political engagement. So, active political engagement, which is voting, uh, is obscure. But that but people before go to vote has to be identified. Okay, so we have to make the distinctions between expressing political view and someone has the possibility to hide what he or she wants to vote to and that is guaranteed, from uh, the debate we're having now, someone is engaged in the political arena, and that political uh, arena might require, in particular circumstances, to show who this person is, okay? And they already make the qualifications, which explain that. So I'm not thinking, uh, so the assumptions here is that um, uh, the public arena is endangering uh, the safety of that individual, and for that reason, she d she doesn't want to say who, who she is. But now, in that is debate of whether there is now a debate about whether that society is truly liberal, and and so now uh, other debate can be triggered for that. There are other consequences of that, uh, but here we are just dealing with the specific situation. Someone is dealing in a liberal society in which uh, individuals are free to engage in the public arena. If you are, translate this debate in a society in which people are fearing uh, to engage in the political arena, and that was the society you mentioned, it. and there are some societies who claim to be liberal, but in, they are persecuting those who are engaged or using the freedom of speech, then I think the debate of, of whether the burqa uh, can change the system is just a matter of speculation. I don't think it's crucial to, the, to this issue. Well, I think part of um, maybe underlying your position is this idea that there has to be um, a link or um, a, a responsibility for people to make their identity known before they take power in public debate. Uh, I hope I'm understanding you correctly. Yeah. And I guess I, I would challenge that on the basis that we allow people to go online and make anonymous comments. Um, we allow people to send letters to the editor without s signing their names, and it's up to the newspaper whether they want to publish that or not. Uh, people could speak at a rally without saying their names before um, addressing the public. So that connection between one's identity and one's views isn't always required in liberal democratic societies. And that's why I think it's problematic to suddenly impose that requirement on this small segment of Muslim women in the rest, West who want to wear uh, the burqa or who choose to wear the burqa. Uh, the way I constructing the narrative, uh, making the rules applying to everyone, not to just the woman wearing the burqa. So if you turn up in a, a political debate with the a motorcycle helmet, you would be called by that safe rules. And he's, so it's not gender specific and is not a race to a religious group. Um, and, and then we, are, we have to, again, make a distinction between uh, engage, anonymous engagement with the political arena, which uh, can 
in my perspective, does not produce the same level of, uh, or is not asked to be uh, treated in a way that is different, or having someone engage directly in the political arena. So, if someone in internet making an anonymous comment, and that's okay. That's, the internet is there to allow individuals who are a bit, uh, for instance, shy or do not want to engage in the political arena to use that forum. But what we, we are speaking of, about here is not a bound on, on comments made on in internet. We are just speaking about a bound of someone who's engaging in a political debate in an open political arena. So where individuals are expected to be accounted for. So we are just dealing with the restrict number of situations, not a general ban on, uh, uh, on anonymous political claims. I think that... Well, I, I guess then there would be two things you'd have to do. One is to be very um, specific about the categories or the types of public debate um, in which you would impose a requirement that people reveal their identities. Um, and the second thing is, is recognize that although this ban may seem fair and across the board, that applies to everybody regardless of how they're concealing their identity, it has a major disparate impact on the religious beliefs or on the, the conscience of Muslim women and would exclude many of them from participating in these forums. For what I think is um, maybe a, a rather tenuous claim that it's, it's necessary to make the debate better or, or people more responsible? Um, obviously, there is a question of degrees here. Uh, the issue is um, whether buying, excluding or precluding a group of individuals, a small group of individuals from the political debate, we have a reduction of the role expected for the political debate. And my answer to that would be on the positive. You, we cannot exclude individuals, uh, whatever is the size of that group in the society. Um, but. Um, and it's, that, it's for that reason, but just because I think the uh, principle of accountability is, is uh, one of the key elements of modern liberal societies, and we expect that for anyone who represents that, even in the civil sector, um, there must be a connection between uh, individuals or identities and a political claim. So that, that uh, issue is is so paramount to modern democracy, not because at this stage we are speaking of a minority which is representing just 3% of the population, but because there is the slippery slope debate, okay? Are we using this to, to exclude others? And then I say, no, we are not using this argument to exclude anyone, but that individual has, has to show who is she, is she want to engage in a political debate that has, on the other hand, individuals who are accountable. Okay. So there is a question of fairness and equipamenity. So would your position be that as long as identity is verified beforehand, then the woman could wear the burqa during the participation? So if there was um, a member of parliament, for example, who chose to wear the burqa? Absolutely. That yes. would be, okay. Oh, yeah, absolutely, yes, yes. The, the, issue, the issue should not be uh, about the religions or uh, what a woman uh, as decide to wear, okay? This debate has already been engaged in the 1960s and 1970s. The debate is closed. They said that everyone can wear whatever they wish with the limit of public decency, but we are not dealing with public decency sure. here, okay? So we are, here we are just dealing with, this, uh, with accountability and responsibility for a, a public engagement. And I think that's where maybe where we would have agreement when it comes to something like parliament, where people, their identity needs to be known, they have a role, but you're stretching that all the way to something like a rally on the street where someone wants to speak on the mic microphone or to someone talking at a pub about po political issues. There we don't necessarily need to make count accountability known between what they're saying and who they are. And if they choose to wear the burqa, um, that would seem to me that there's not a, a good reason for preventing them from doing so. Um, again, uh, th this is stretching my argument to a point which I don't want to, <laughs> to, to, to good. Um, I think my, my argument is, is, is restricted to political engagement. So a political rally, I would expect that the individuals would make, if they had the possibility to actively engage the speakers or the, or, or, um, or the people who are present at the speaker, they had to, they had to be recognizable, okay, for the same principle. This might not work in, in, in public houses or in park, and this is the stand in which the band goes in France and in Belgium, because um, there is very little, on my opinions, that can support that 
level of prescriptions. But in a situation in which uh, there is a public demand and he has a political aim, so the, the debate is engaging public representatives, for instance, or people who appoint themselves a public representative of a community. In that situation, individuals have to show who they are, because that's what we expect from our representatives. Okay. Okay. Well, I, I think it's possible our views have converged um, more <laughs> than they were when, when we began the debate. Okay. Thank you very much. Thanks, Peter and Jeremy. Um, are there any questions, first of all, from the audience? And I'll just ask you, there is a handheld mic, so just so that we can capture the question for the benefit of the recording, if you could wait until you have that. Did you have a question? Yes? It's already on. Well, uh, thank you, Jeremy and v Vito. It's Reid Mortensen. Uh, I, I agree with you completely about the, the need to allow the wearing of the burqa in public, and I think that that's entirely compatible with the, um, the Commonwealth tradition of, of uh, giving a place to religious pluralism in the public square. I'm just wondering, Jeremy, if you ever think there is a point at which a ban or removal might be ordered. Okay. And in particular, uh, another aspect of the public square, and that's in legal proceedings. Yes, and, and that is, I think, one of the most challenging aspects because there we have, it, it goes up against the, the traditional common law right to confrontation, a constitutional right in, in many countries, where we have this idea that the defendant and um, his or her counsel should be able to evaluate the witness during a legal proceeding um, for credibility, that we want the jury to be able to evaluate their demeanor for credibility. And the wearing of a facial covering of, of any type undermines that right. Um, so there we have, a classic um, case where we have to balance rights. We have to balance freedom of religion of the witness who wants to testify and wear the burqa against the, the right to confront one's accuser or to the witnesses against one. Um, and there I think, although it's difficult, we have to come down on the side of the defendant because their very life or, or liberty may be at stake depending on um, the proceedings against them. Now there are some ways that um, real um, courtrooms have accommodated um, these sorts of issues. Um, there can be um, some uh, limitations on allowing the public into the courtroom so that it reduces the number of people who see the woman without her burqa on. Um, there's been cases where um, a temporary judge who's female has been brought in instead of a male judge because that won't cause as many problems from the um, Muslim woman's point of view. So some accommodations can be made, but I do agree with you that there are some points where um, the, the burqa has to be removed if it, comes, if it comes down to the right of a criminal defendant. Thanks, Sam. Well, um, I just want to introduce a hypothetical and see your opinions actually on it. Let's assume that it's actually a man that wants to cover his head. Let's assume that they want to wear a mask for an undisclosed reason. Uh, how do you see that? Would that still be something that we should allow in our society? Peter, do you want to? Um, on the basis of what I just said, uh, um, uh, the general answer is yes, that person can wear a mask, but depends what he, what what is the role of the mask and uh, is behaving in relation to what he is, or he is planning to do. So um, I was thinking there is this individual in, in, in the United Kingdom that made a point to travel from the south to the north completely naked, okay? And as long as not engaging um, um, the area of the city which are very populated is allowed to do so, okay? Uh, but if he does so, then there is the debate about public decency and he will get the fine, okay? So, and the same situation with the mask in relation to what that individual uh, uh, is doing. So in as long that uh, that activity does not engage uh, criminal prescriptions and security or, or is not doing something which we are just discussing here, so a political activity um, in which he used the mask to hide himself in the public debate. Um, as long as he's not doing that, well, he, he should be allowed to wear a mask. I would say, I think it's a really um, fascinating question because there we have an example where we don't know that wearing the mask is based on a sincere religious belief. So we can exclude freedom of religion from it. But mm. there are arguably other rights that may be brought into the fold. Um, some people talk about a right to anonymity. 
arguably a right to privacy. They're in the European Union, they're developing a, a right to be forgotten. Mm -hmm. um, so there are some other positions that one might take to say that should be a guaranteed right in public to conceal one's face. Um, and, and that's a much closer case than I think if there's a sincere religious belief behind the, the wearing of the facial covering. Thank you. I think that we might uh, keep going, but I will ask... Well, at the beginning, I said that I wouldn't ask people for their opinions, but if, there would, if you'd like to give a show of hands, if your opinion changed as a result of the presentation and the debate. Anyone? No? Looks like everyone has stuck <laughs> to their guns. Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> we'll see as we move on through yes, the proceedings yes. whether... <laughs> We don't know who's the winner or who's the, who's, um, the better debater.